so I'm Isabel Ferreras, and I'm really delighted to uh, welcome you for uh, this first uh, session uh, out of this duo of um, sessions that we will have in the context of the Cher SFPI at the Collège Belgique. Um, so you might know that we have a Cher SFPI here at the Royal Academy, and um, we had a first uh, period during which, for two years, Max Crae uh, held the Cher, uh, and Max uh, worked very intensely uh, with the steering committee of the share, which is composed of um, academicians and academiciennes. And of course, the floor is very noisy, <laughs> so just please, um, no worries. Welcome. Um, and uh, I am uh, very uh, honored to be the uh, coordinator for the, the steering committee of the CHER, um, uh, which um, we, we use as a, basically as a support team for the holder of the CHER to uh, uh, be able to de develop uh, his own work in the best possible ways here at the Académie Royale. Today, actually, the members of the, the steering committee are uh, not, were not able to be present except for Kenneth Bertrams. Thank you, Kenneth, who's a, a member of the Classe des Lettres, Sciences Morales et Politiques, um, an historian of, uh, a business historian at uh, the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Um, um, I guess I should say uh, that we will have so two sessions today and next uh, Tuesday, um, and um, we will organize the conversation uh, the following way. Jérôme is going to uh, develop uh, his views about the question that he's going to tackle today during an hour. Then we'll take a very short break and we will then have uh, the space for uh, discussion, uh, but we will finish by 7 p.m. Uh, not only because it's the tradition that the Collège Belgique needs to end at 7 p.m., but also because I need to take the train to go to teach at Louvain-la-Neuve. So we will hold that. Uh, then next Tuesday, uh, we hope very much that you will also come back because these are really uh, two uh, sort of mutually necessary uh, uh, sessions. We will continue the conversations, building up on what Jérôme said today, uh, built on our exchange, um, and um, that is the opening of this two-year period during which Jérôme is going to work here at uh, the Academy. So this is also, it was not... Um, envisioned that way, but actually it works very nicely. Uh, these two sessions really are taking place at uh, the onset of that two-year period that Jérôme is going to spend here. So uh, we very much look forward your input, uh, your feedback, uh, your take on whatever Jero Jérôme is going to say, because Jérôme is going to definitely uh, listen to what uh, you say, to what we say, so that he can orient the next steps of uh, his own work here at uh, the Academy. So thank you very much for being present. And I uh, guess I will just uh, say that Jérôme uh, just finished uh, brilliantly uh, his uh, PhD uh, at the University of Cologne. Um, you might know that Max was also uh, from uh, German origin, so we, we are building up a very special relationship with Germany, <laughs> uh, as I understand, uh, in, the, in the context of the share. It's totally... Uh, um, unplanned, but uh, it uh, is working that way and so far very nicely. So thank you very much, Jérôme, and the floor is yours, um, and we will let you speak. Uh, but of course, because this is not such a big crowd, if there is anything that you don't understand or that really impedes you following the, the reasoning that Jérôme is uh, developing, uh, feel free to raise your hand and, and interact. Jérôme is, so far as I understood, a very interactive person. 
So you won't mind. Uh, merci, Madame Présidente. And uh, thank you to the members of the Academy Royale, of course, the Belgique and the College Belgique, um, who have so graciously given me this opportunity and this platform to speak um, on these topics. And as Isabel just emphasized, uh, I'm not uh, here as uh, Moses coming down from the mountain with the tablets, but I'm just initiating a discussion on the basis of my own limited knowledge, and I'm very interested in hearing what members of the general public of the Academy and others have to say um, uh, to, these, to these thoughts. So the topic is embedding uh, firms within the mission economy. Why should the firm be part of a sustainable agenda? And I suppose that is a question. So uh, to begin, I thought I would review uh, the past findings of the chair, uh, SFP. Uh, Max Kai, of course, in the last year, put out this uh, small booklet with the Opinio uh, series uh, from system level to investment uh, level sustainability and epistemological one-way street. Um, basically, he, in this uh, work, discussed the notion of downward translation, suggesting that one needs to work from a universe of, of, of what one could call missions or agendas or principles in designing any type of a sustainable uh, uh, mission. Uh, project of investment. And he emphasized, of course, designing a democratic process in this, uh, in this context, including uh, developing taxonomy, developing sustainable account, sustainability accounting, excuse me. If I'm speaking too quickly, I know English is not everyone's first language here, but so just please tell me. Uh, 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 long to long. You might yes. Yes. And uh, a macro indicator framework that uh, that was also suggested by by Max. Also, be easier this way. Yes. So um, again, this is just a basic review before starting uh, on our journey today. Um, Max also suggested looking at existing uh, the existing architecture of uh, you know frameworks like the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, which you can see here as this type of a menu. I will come back to these again and again in this talk and the EU taxonomy, uh, basically reflecting on the use of existing frameworks before branching out and developing new, new tools. And he also suggested looking at the potential use of um, existing financial regulations, um, which we do have some, and non-financial regulations as well. There's the non-financial reporting directive of the EU, um, and of course, emphasizing the role of investors like SFP in their uh, actual activity towards creating a more sustainable economy. And this is just a graphic I came up with to synthesize these various ideas. Um, again, you have your government, civil society, uh, working together on a taxonomy that is then uh, informs investors, including SFP, as to which in, within the universe of possible investments according to goals and firms that exist, one can actually uh, or should uh, partake in uh, and uh, of course, they also need information through things like the sustainability accounting that goes back to investors to see what actually worked and what did not work. So it's an iterative process. We don't have a god, uh, God's view, so to speak. Um, yes. So that's just sort of a, 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 view, a, a review of uh, the past work of this chair. And I wanted to very quickly move on to um, somebody who actually inspired the, the current um, uh, call, uh, which, who's Philip de Woot, who should be a name for many of you here. And um, in particular, uh, the second chair intends to build on, on his legacy in constructing a vision towards embedding sustainability at the level of the firm. And in order to do that, I thought it would be important to actually look at what uh, Philip de Woot uh, wrote, thought, and said regarding these, these issues. The first concept that I would emphasize of uh, De Woot's work is the notion of the interregnum, which he actually borrows from Antonio Gramsci. And he says the following, periods of transition are always difficult. As Gramsci said, the old dies, the new does not yet see the day. In this interregnum, monsters rise up. These monsters, he says, are already visible. Widespread poverty, ethnic conflict, the destruction of resources and biodiversity. So we do see a, a transition today and have to plan accordingly. The second concept that I wish to emphasize is the problem of personalized power. And Devoot writes, power that is over-personalized can lead to excesses 
excessive centralization, failure to listen or delegate, a court-like climate of intrigue and excesses in terms of strategic ambitions, future projects, diversification, poorly planned acquisitions and empires built too quickly. Examples abound of strategies adopted by a heroic leader and that arose more from a bet or from over-optimism than from economic reasoning, looking at the example of Vivendi as, as, as a case. He also discusses the civic duties of firms, suggesting that if firms are to integrate with the community and take responsibility for the social consequences of their actions, they will have to redefine their raison d'etre and their role in an economic system that is off course and in which they are the principal players. This system, he says, is only an element of a much larger one. He says, since the time of Aristotle, the European tradition has been for econ economics, excuse me, ethics and politics to form part of a single entity. Economics is only a subsystem, and by restricting the aim of the firm simply to financial success, its civic dimension is eliminated. By not making it focus more on the general interest, there is a danger of losing its legitimacy. Thus, Devout suggested finding a new raison d'etre of the firm. He wrote, the firm will only become responsible if it subscribes to an all-embracing view of human progress, economic and technical progress for what, for whom, and how. These questions, he says, are of an ethical and political nature, so the market is incapable of answering them on its own. We are concerned, he says, with the political and moral questions that are being posed to the market economy and the firms that operate in it. These firms will only become responsible if they accept and integrate the answers to these questions into their aims and values. This means it will require a change in culture, emphasizing process uh, over theoretical definitions. Uh, in a global economy, he says, the uh, raison d'etre of the firm is to ensure economic and technical progress that furthers human progress uh, and facilitates the type of society we wish to have. And he sees the notion of sustainable development as the, that that is closest to this. Provided the firm does not treat sustainable development as merely an instrument of public relations. It is not a question, he says, of conducting a, def a defensive campaign or promoting a new image of legitimacy. It is by adopting a proactive stance that the firm will become responsible and uh, posi uh, position its actions in a wider context. New criteria will influence its strategic choice uh, the protection of the planet, respect for populations, greater social justice, prudence in the application of science. The direction taken by development will not depend exclusively on the pressures of technologies, the financial markets, or consumers stirred up by advertising, but on true debate by society. One of the more interesting concepts I think that uh, Devout develops is the notion of homo faba, which you can see is the, the man who does, uh, which he contrasts, of course, to homo sapiens, the man who, of knowledge. And he says, economic and technical evolution is more rapid than ethical, political, or legal reflection. The homo faba is beginning to dominate the homo sapiens. To this is added the complexity of our management systems, understanding of which is beginning to elude us. There is a danger in the possibility of undesirable indirect effects, or even the results that are the opposite to those that are expected. A major example, he says, is research and its commercial applications. We only have to think of the COVID uh, vaccines as, a, as an example of this. Having become important weapons in the competitive arsenal, science and technology are caught up in the market logic, which accelerates their progress and uses them immediately without asking sufficient questions about their impact on society or the environment. A typical attitude, says Devout, is one presses on, one ensures market share, and any negative effects can be dealt with later. To this, he opposes a notion of stewardship. And uh, he says, added to the fact that the pace of technological development leaves little time for corrections to be made, such corrections are becoming increasingly difficult and the freedom to make them is diminishing. This imposes on us a principle of precaution, he says, when making fundamental choices, as well as a duty to stop any project that reveals itself to be dangerous. Climate change is one such domain, he says, in which this principle should be applied systematically. Circumspection is at the heart of ethical action. 
Secondly, says Devut, the making of economic and technical progress does not justify the possible risks when it involves improving something that is already satisfactory in order to produce a paradise on earth. This reminds me a bit of the discussion, I think if some of you were here at the Euro Kass uh, 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 conference, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, on uh, so-called low-tech solutions. Um, the procedural approach is also preferred by Devout, and he says, in fact, what the firm needs is a return to politics. Entrepreneurs, financiers, and the market cannot be the only directors of economic evolution, even though it is their specific domain of action. Sustainable development concerns all people. It is part of the public domain. In order to decide on the type of society we are to create together, we must listen to all those who have something to say citing Jürgen Habermas and his notion of procedural um, reason. He also emphasizes the goal of investment funds, saying, which I think would be important in this context of the chair SFPE. He says, we should also recall the power of investment funds and pension funds. If these continue to be guided by traditional criteria, they will present a major obstacle to the evolution of the development model. Citing monks, Devout suggests that they are well, the wealth funds are well placed to impose basic rules such as new criteria for the investment of their funds. They would then be capable of initiating change in those countries that drag their feet in the area. Several ethical funds, he says, have been established, but they only represent an infinitesimal part of the sector and their results are not yet impressive. We only have to look at the notion of uh, activist investors and certainly some, there has been some change since this book has been written. Um, now that I've had this, uh, this um, view of, of the legacy of Philippe de Wood, I wanted to look actually if we are looking at the or considering the possibility of embedding the firm in a, a mission economy, what is the firm and how do we understand it? So of course, to begin with, uh, I have some training in neoclassical economics. Uh, uh, not a fan of it, but it is very influential. So I thought to start with the, the basic uh, outline of the firm in neoclassical economics. And in the neoclassical view of the firm, it is seen as a nexus of contracts. Uh, the firm can be seen as a price taker. It can be seen as a profit maximizer. Uh, much of this is based on the legacy of Leon Valra, a Swiss economist at the turn of the 19th century. Uh, who used uh, classical mechanics and uh, fluid dynamics, basically the physics of the 19th century, uh, applying this uh, to uh, economic interaction, price formation, and similar such phenomena. So, in fact, one can see, according to this view, the firm as a uh, type of operating as inert matter, uh, and it, it is a, it's a recipient of information. Um, and of course, uh, looking at Kate Raworth's uh, work, the Donut Economics, uh, this is a, a metaphor, an image, uh, and she emphasizes the importance of these basic images in the creation of meaning. Uh, Philip Murawski suggests that uh, the engineer econo uh, economist, in his book, More Light Than Heat, uh, the engineer economists were lost in the funhouse because there were no guiding principles to exert control over their research other than the single overriding mandate, copy the physics. Hamiltonians, he says, were legitimate largely because they were copied from physics. Such phenomena might seem novel to economists, but at bottom, he says, it is still 19th century physics. The shiny toys might distract attention, but the knowledgeable players understood that it all never ventured outside the world of Laplacian dream equations. In the 20th century, he says, the new generation of neoclassicals did make reference to the ferment in modern physics, but to a man, he argues, they stopped well short of ever actually appropriating any substantive 20th century physics metaphor. He uses Paul Samuelson as an example of this. I might also cite Frank Knight, uh, one of the primary neoclassical economists, a uh, grand homme in this field, who suggested of the firm, it is characteristic of the enterprise organization that labor is directed by its employer, not its owner, in a way analogous to material equipment. Certainly, there is in this respect no sharp difference between a free laborer and a horse, not to mention a slave, who would, of course, be property. This, again, looks... Uh, 
to be an example of what Philip de Wood called the single thought. Mm -hmm. And of course, Milton Friedman suggested that a firm uh, serve the social function by maximizing its profits. Now, there is some detraction from this view, even within the domain of mainstream economics. So we have someone like the individual on the top right, uh, top left, excuse me, uh, Ronald Coase, one of the winners of the Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize in economics, who suggests that planning does occur everywhere in the economy. In fact, he, he stated, yet in the real world, we find that there are many areas in which the market logic does not apply. If a workman moves from department Y to department X, he does so not because of a change in relative prices, but because he is ordered to do so. Those, he says, who object to economic planning on the grounds that the problem is solved by price movements can be answered by pointing out that there is planning within the economic system. He says this was in fact not ignored by economists. Alfred Marshall, John Bates Clark, Frank Knight, who I've just cited, he cites as examples of agency and firms. He says, as D.H. Robertson points out, we find islands of conscious power in an ocean of unconscious cooperation, like lumps of butter coagulating in a pail of buttermilk. And in fact, a recent book, it's more of a left-wing uh, rag, The People's Republic of Walmart, looks at a company like Sears and Roebuck, which tried to uh, introduce market logic into the internal structures of the firm, and it was a disaster. So this type of uh, analysis led to the traditional distinction that you see in the theory of the firm between hierarchy on the one side and the market on the other. And you have people like Oliver Williamson with his notion of transaction cost economics, uh, Henry Hansmann and his notion of the ownership of enterprise as examples. The question, of course, that I would like to ask is, are all hierarchies identical? Um, in this regard, I would like to cite the uh, British uh, philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, who suggested a fallacy of misplaced concreteness. And Whitehead suggests this fallacy, excuse me, this fallacy consists in neglecting the degree of abstraction involved when an actual entity is considered merely so far as it exemplifies certain categories of thought. There are aspects of actualities which are simply ignored so long as we restrict thought to these categories. Thus, the success of a philosophy, says Whitehead, is to be measured by its comparative avoidance of this fallacy when thought is restricted within its categories. And we do see over time a movement away from what Anwar Sheikh has called the Garden of Eden, thinking with regards to the firm and production. Another individual I could cite is Kenneth Arrow, another recipient of the Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics, who wrote uh, in his book, The Limits of Organization, thus there cannot be a completely consistent meaning to collective rationality. We have at some point a relation of pure power. And how the distribution is going to be resolved cannot be answered unequivocally, nor can we easily say that there are objectively valid ethical criteria. But internally, he continues, and especially at lower levels, the relation among the employees in a firm are very different from the arm's length bargaining of our textbooks. As Herbert Simon, he says, has observed, an employment contract is in many ways very different from an ordinary commodity contract. Finally, he argues that the, we cannot mediate all our responsibilities to others through prices, uh, through paying for them. And this makes it essential in the running of society that we have what might be called conscience, a feeling of responsibility for the effects of one's actions on others. Now, this move away from what Sheikh has called the Garden of Eden uh, is described by some as a post walrasian tradition. Uh, Bowles and Gintis suggest that this is described by a move away from exogenous or automatic, if you will, contract enforcement and uh, preference, uh, what's called preference endogeneity. That means people are not prefabricated or preformed, but in fact develop, learn, change over time, uh, even in their consumption uh, and in their preferences. Uh, Amatya Sen's uh, capabilities approach might be familiar to some of you, is, uh, can be considered part of the post war raising tradition. It does relax the second preference, uh, the second uh, aspect, the preference endogeneity, maintains the first one. And er ergodicity economics, which is a very new uh, school uh, of microeconomics in particular, 
uh, can also be considered a uh, part of this tradition. You have on the bottom right here, Ole Peters, who is, I think, on his way to some conference. And in fact, uh, Erdogicity economics removes the traditional Bernoulli assumption of equal time and ensemble averages in uh, utility or preference formation. I'm not gonna get into all this theory at the moment. These are just to, to, to point out that uh, there are uh, constitutive elements that have been, or you could say constructivist elements that have been introduced into uh, economics in recent decades. Um, and less and less are we able to assume a static or preformed uh, existence for individuals or the firm. We have things like information asymmetry, principal agent relations, and so on. Not going to get into all of that. And Bowles and Gintas conclude that however constitutive behaviors are conceptualized, the stress on the explanatory power of such behaviors for economic theory may well be the beginning of a series of successful incursions of sociological issues into microeconomic theories. And the point is that no, not all hierarchies are equal. Uh, Gregory Dow has developed what he's called the asymmetry principle to, to represent uh, the fact that, for instance, labor-owned firm, uh, managed firms can also have hierarchies. Lucio Bighiero uh, is a colleague who's also worked on this area. Myself, I've focused on this in my own work. Um, in any case, moving away from this mechanistic or machine-like notion of the firm, we also should uh, acknowledge that there is a, another way of interpreting the firm. Uh, a relational view, which sees not a, a nexus of contracts, but a nexus of relationships, and sees the firm also as a firm-specific network, so automatically integrating the, the universe or the outside world into the notion of the firm. We have people like Jeffrey Pfeffer with his notion of resource dependency theory. And if we look at firms today, we have interlocking boards, so there are a lot of relations amongst firms. They are not an aggregation of individuals, uh, contracting towards a specific goal like maximizing profit, but rather they are an emergent network of individuals and other stakeholders, groups, for instance, municipalities, states, creating value in a shared way subject to constraints. The main constraint, of course, is that of the going constraint, uh, excuse me, the going concern. So the, the company cannot go bankrupt as long as it does not go bankrupt. Uh, the firm is, in fact, open to many different missions against Milton Friedman's adage that the firm serves social, its social purpose by maximizing profit. Um, so we do have some notions like stakeholder theory of Freeman. I will come back to this in a moment uh, in a critical way. Uh, the, the question really is, how does one organize firms in the anarchy of the market? Now, we should acknowledge that not all firms are identical. Uh, I have a picture here of some classical examples of large-scale firms. On the top right, you have a, a comical depiction, a caricature of a Rockefeller's Standard Oil. On the bottom left are two Zaibatsu, the famous uh, Japanese uh, 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 networks, if you will, of, of large enterprises, Mitsubishi and Mitsui, and the top left is IG Farben, a German cartel. Of course, these are all large-scale, one might say multinational firms, although at the time they were quite nationally restricted. Very similar, but also very different, based on a very particular historical context. Um, and they're not alone. Of course, on the bottom right here, you have the Raiffeisen logo, which you know, is, has a tradition, the Raiffeisen banks, which is very different than either or any of these other companies. Um, the point is that a spectrum of uh, firms exists. The CodesNet project, which was supported by the uh, European Commission, lists four different distinct types of firms in existence. The first that they describe is called the Pacific Rim, which is uh, very, uh, can be characterized by American post-war capitalism, things like Silicon Valley, where you have a very large, large scale, privately held uh, enterprise. Uh, the second type is the OPEC type. Of course, the Middle East, Russia, Latin America, there are a number of these very resource dependent Single, uh, uh, single commodity economies, high degree of corruption, usually, or in transparency, I should say. The third is uh, state capitalism. China, of course, is the best example. Uh, 
also, well, there's a great degree of market diversity, but also a high degree of um, state action within and control of the economy. And the fourth is the EU, which has a large degree of um, small and medium uh, enterprise-based clusters. In Germany, we have, for instance, Baden-Württemberg in, in the area of, of, of Stuttgart and Sindelfing. Uh, you have in the Basque region of Spain, you have Emilia-Romagna in Italy. There are many of these uh, in, in Europe. So. The point is that achieving firm level sustainable investments actually requires consideration of this, this context when developing policy. So Belgium, for instance, is not China. It's also not the United States. And it requires developing missions that connect history with certain principles or with these missions or connecting these missions with history, I should rather say. And they require a pluralistic focus. So again, uh, Bertrand, I think you have a focus on the, uh, the um, Philippe Bertrand, on the uh, Belgian cooperatives. So again, if there's a local tradition, that should be made use of. Before moving on, I think there's also an importance on, in looking at a, this, the distinction between economy and ecology. Um, the philosopher Marvin Brown has suggested uh, that these two terms are uh, siblings, that they are related. Ecology has the Greek root logos, uh, understanding. Economy has the root nomos of managing. And he suggests it is somewhat absurd to manage something that one does not understand. So we need an ecological or ecosystems view uh, in order to actually then, in the second step, manage uh, the economy. Uh, the ecologist Robert Ulanovitz has developed what he calls a window of viability. Uh, proposing that this concept viability is in fact much more important than say efficiency. If things are too efficient, they become brittle and vulnerable, such as we saw in the global financial crisis of 2008 and onwards, as well as we saw in the last crisis due to COVID. So we need some redundancy, there need to be some uh, interconnections. Uh, and again, this is what I mean by pluralistic focus. I think moving on now to uh, the next portion of the talk, uh, I think we do have to acknowledge that we have a problem, and we do have a problem with democracy. Uh, if we saw the recent election in Italy and many other places in the world, there is a lack of legitimacy, and one can draw a number of books from the shelf that describe and discuss these problems. I have three uh, that I've just picked here. Um, uh, Danny Roderick, I think he's at Harvard, has talked about the trilemma in which he says hyper-globalization, democracy, and modern uh, states uh, national state boundaries, you can have two of the three, but not all three. Uh, so one has to make a choice of which of these we would like to keep, democracy, hyper-globalization, or uh, national states. Uh, Benjamin Page at Northwestern University has talked about the unresponsiveness of government uh, towards citizen uh, belief and opinion over many, many decades. Um, focusing mainly on the United States, but of course uh, his findings can be, certainly be replicated in other places. For instance, in one paper he suggested, I think it was 2014, that only 0.1% of the United States population has a significant impact on its public policy. Wilkerson and Pickett, um, to, uh, one medical doctor, uh, and I think Pickett is a I think she's also, there are two medical doctors, yes, who in 2009 wrote The Spirit Level, a book which actually promoted my interest in economics to begin with, uh, that more equal societies have lower rates of crime, uh, uh, youth pregnancy, uh, and similar, uh, similar phenomena. In a more recent book, The Inner Level, they suggested that this also applies to things like depression, mental health. So equality pays. However, all of this is at the very macro level, and this talk is about the role of the firm in a sustainable agenda. So how does all of this look inside the firm? And here I would like to draw on somebody who's in the room here, our own Isabel Ferreras, who has written a book, The uh, Firms as Political Entities, where she has looked at notions like, uh, like the firm as a, uh, excuse me, a political theory of the firm, comparing corporations to firms saying that um, the political theory of firm would be comparable in evaluative and critical manner to the neoclassical theory or the economic theory of the firm. She says firms, in fact, are structured using corporations. They are not corporations. 
In fact, a corporation, she says, is a legal entity founded by a group of capital owners who organize themselves using a certificate of incorporation, which is a legal instrument recognized and administered by a state and which has legal standing in the courts. The corporation, she says, is usually run by a board of directors, uh, which is empowered to mobilize it as a legal entity to enter and honor contracts. The directors use the assets that the corporation controls to develop the firm, something different. And that this, she says, is not confined or defined by its legal existence of the corporation alone, and indeed has no clear definition under the law. The firm is, is it, it, or it, this is a broadened or conception of the firm that places emphasis on the relationships that the firm comprises. And in fact, uh, this theory uh, builds on a long tradition of locating the firm outside of the strict market or contractual relation. Uh, includes scholars like Torstein Veblen, Burl and Means, for whom, according to uh, Isabel Ferreras, ownership of the firm is an irrelevant concept. Dispelling the tenacious notion that a firm is owned by its security holders is important, she says, because it is a first step towards understanding that control over a firm's decisions is not necessarily the province of security holders. And in fact, Looking at work uh, going from a uh, private to public notion is very important. I originally had a picture here of, uh, of the, um, the Hawthorne uh, factory. Um, I'll get into a moment. Um, historical, says uh, Isabel Ferreras, and economic conditions today are ripe for work to complete its transition into the public sphere. Industrial society is giving away to service society, and as it does, workers' presence and role in the public sphere is growing. Labor is no longer and can therefore no longer be considered as a vehicle or instrument, nor can work any longer be seen as a mere object of policy, state regulation, and labor management actions. So the reason I have the um, Hawthorne factory is because this was one of the first ethnographic or sociological studies of factory life in the United States in Chicago in the 1920s and 30s. And in fact, scientists went there to ask the question if workers would be more productive with more light. And they found out actually workers were in fact more productive with more light and they were more productive with less light. And they found in fact that uh, what was making the workers more productive was the attention of the scientists. So this was uh, in fact leads me to the next topic of uh, expressive versus instrumental rationality. Uh, and Isabel Ferreras argues we cannot wholly understand the reality of the firm if we do not acknowledge that what is, uh, it is at the same time driven by another form of logic, by a rationality she proposes to call expressive rationality. While capital investors in the contemporary global and financial age are highly mobile and can easily arbitrate on rates of return on investment, labor investors uh, are for the most part driven by expressive rationality as they invest their persons, not their capital, uh, in the everyday workings of the firm. Thus, the operation of these two rationalities makes possible, uh, Isabel Ferreras argues, the activity of the firm. Denying the existence and influence of either one of these poses the gra a grave threat to the robustness of the firm and its future. Therefore, identifying the existence of these two rationalities allows us to build a better analytical account of the reality of the firm. One of the most interesting concepts, I think, in this book is the notion of the bicameral moment. Um, in ancient Rome, uh, says uh, Isabel Ferreira, si uh, citizens were divided into two categories, patricians and plebeians. Patricians owned the real vast majority of the land and slaves and spent their time pursuing noble occupations such as politics or the art of war. The plebeians comprised the inferior social strata excluding slaves uh, who worked manual labor as manual laborers or tradesmen and lived uh, marginal lives of delinquency or poverty. They did not participate in political life. This continued, she says, until the beginning of the fifth century before our time, when the people rebelled in an event known as the Secessio Plebis. The outcome of uh, this conflict was a historical political compromise through which the equal rights of the plebeians were slowly recognized. One immediate uh, result uh, of this confrontation, says uh, Ferreras, the creation of a tribune of the plebs who were given what was known as negative sovereignty, meaning uh, 
Rome's two consuls then forth needed the approval of the plebeian magistrates to govern, since the latter could block any of their decisions. And of course, we can talk about uh, you know, other types of bicameral moments, even in ancient Athens with the Thetes, the, the rowers, or the popolo, the popolo uh, republican governments of Northern Italy in the Renaissance and the Middle Ages. Um, in fact, I think it's important to, to discuss and, and, and cover many more of such uh, what I call genealogies of democracy. And the lesson I think that can be made from such bicameral moments, and that Isabel Ferreras points out, is that tremendous, the tremendous impact it had on Roman society, uh, the fruits of the conflict, she says, between plebeians and patricians, uh, together they found a way to transform structural exploitation into productive cooperation, made social cooperation, and this made social cooperation possible again. In fact, it was an increase in accountability. Um, Alfred uh, North Whitehead would talk about the notion of society as process, and again, we can see uh, a firm even as a society, or as uh, Isabel Ferreira says, as a polity. She says, it is clear that a rigorous and comprehensive understanding of a firm's uh, actors, its polity, cannot be accurately uh, limited to the shareholders bound by the corporation. We suggest, she says, that the firm's polity uh, should be defined as those who are both actively concerned with goal setting and those who are affected uh, by those goals. And she looks at the example of someone who's making apps in the Apple App Store. Um, the recent uh, Manifest Travail, uh, Travail is also very important here. In English, of course, the uh, book on uh, democratizing work, which I think has come out this year, right? Yes. So um, very, very quickly, covering some of these notions, the reductio ad corporationem. Uh, Ferreras and her co-authors argue that while the risk taken by capital investors is restricted to the sum they originally invested, the risk borne by labor investors is not. This risk is coming to be recognized as a serious one and their return on investment as unfair when compared with that of capital investors. With the rise of the platform economy, more and more corporations are deploying strategies aimed at denying employment relationships, even the most basic protections, and allowing capital investors to escape even the most basic responsibilities associated with the role of the employer, what is called the reductio ad corporationem. And an important tradition that is recalled in this book is that uh, the history of collective bargaining Collective bargaining laid, uh, according to the book, a cornerstone in a new democratic architecture of work relations. Why? It formally recognized that any economic endeavor is the result of the collective labor investment provided by workers, and that this labor investment should be represented collectively from the firm level up. A firm, the book argues, should not be able to negotiate employment terms and working conditions for workers that are less favorable to the standards negotiated at upper levels, say the nation, the sector, or the international level. Very interesting concept is the fact that ownership is not uh, everything. So uh, Ferreras, I think, argues in this book that the history of ESOPs, of course, for those who don't know, they are employee stock ownership plans in the United States, very popular form of, of ownership of firms in the US, I think there are about 7,000 of them, uh, shows that true democratic conversion is a credible option while also revealing the severe limitations of democratization strategies that are based solely on property ownership. It should be very clear that the mechanism of the dual majority or double collective veto rights, uh, for instance, in the, uh, uh, the Tribune of the Plebs, is distinct from capitalist democratization strategies that focus on access to property ownership. The right of workers, argues uh, Ferreras, uh, to a collective say in decisions regarding their organizations should not be made contingent upon and are not justified by property ownership. Lastly, the concept of pluralism, I think, that follows directly from this observation is that uh, the point of this proposal is to open the door to a much broader range of democratically governed firms, including hybrid organizational structures, self-managed organizations, cooperatives, commons, or other structures in which capital contributions do not automatically come with political rights, but instead remain debts to be paid back collectively. This would be a new chapter in the history of democracy, one in which firms could at long last be included 
providing that they uh, meet the standard of guaranteeing that, guaranteeing that their workers have the right to collectively validate or veto those uh, firm strategic decisions. And coming back to this uh, notion of the stakeholder theory of Freeman, there is a criticism of corporate social responsibility in this book of uh, democratizing work. All too often, uh, uh, Madame Presidente <laughs> argues, uh, over the past three decades, initiatives grouped into the category of corporate social responsibility have ended up diluting the constituent power of workers by drowning it in the ocean of stakeholders affected to varying degrees by corporate activities. Unlike the firm's labor investors who are not only affected but governed by the government of the corporation. The result of this has been to further consolidate shareholder supremacy, distracting from any serious reflection on the specificities of labor investment by workers in firms. Now, I feel all of this, uh, these, uh, these books are similar to a tradition that has uh, been ongoing for some uh, decades or even centuries. Um, particularly the tradition of philosophically of phenomenology, to which I return in a moment very briefly. Karl Polanyi, I would be remiss to not uh, mention with his notion of fictitious commodities and embedding. The notion by uh, David Ellerman of neo-abolitionism uh, returning to uh, what he calls democratic liberal theory, uh, which he contrasts with conventional classical liberalism, the latter of which he claims dumbs down the intellectual history of democratic theory into the question of consent versus coercion. In fact, argues Ellerman, a much more useful distinction is that between alienation and delegation. The effect, he says, of shifting the focus of debate from alienation versus delegation to consent versus coercion is, he says, to obfuscate the paradox um, of one of the most remarkable disconnects in history. We also have notions like uh, Albert Hirschman's uh, exit voice and loyalty, the spillover hypothesis by Carol Pateman, who suggests that more participation in the workplace uh, spills over or converts to more participation in the political sphere. Um, there's much more to be said here. Uh, Gestalt psychology of, of Kurt Leben, cybernetics, much more can be said. Um, one of my favorite slides uh, here, and I could actually give a presentation just on this slide, um, concerns the social dimensions of productive uh, relations. And of course, we should remind ourselves uh, of the history of the modern wage contract as residing in the master-slave um, uh, relationship. So people like um, Otto von Gierke uh, have argued that Roman jurisprudence had little room for recognizing the supremacy of personal rights over property rights. Thus, uh, the classical Greek and Roman scholar Moses Finley comments that um, even after the conversion of Constantine the emperor to Christianity and the rapid incorporation of the church into the imperial power structure, there is not a trace of legislation designed to turn away from slavery, not even by gradual steps. On the contrary, it was that most Christian of emperors, Justinian, whose codification of the Roman law in the sixth century not only included the most complete collection of laws about slavery ever assembled, but also provided Christian Europe with a ready-made legal foundation for the slavery they introduced into the new world a thousand years later. Hegel, uh, you know, I'm actually from Hegel's hometown, so I would be remiss in not uh, mentioning uh, him, uh, who has made many waves in the world, of course, influencing people like the young Karl Marx. Uh, and Hegel uh, observed that relations of production, in fact, are relations of things, consisting, he said, of, of two moments, unequal and contradictory, one of which he calls the für sich sein, being for itself, and the other für ein anderes sein, being for another. Um, practical autonomy, he argued, of the servant is a purely negative power, uh, he suggested, was der Knecht tut, is eigentlich tun des Herrn. What the servant does is actually the, the action of the master. However, in the process of productive relations, uh, argued Hegel importantly, the servant is able to develop a real autonomy. And in fact, as Susan Buck Morris observes, Hegel was uh, writing these lines as he observed slave rebellions in the colonies, particularly in Saint-Domingue, uh, in Haiti, in, uh, for instance, journals that were contemporary, like Minerva. So Hegel, in critiquing Immanuel Kant, suggested that one could not merely base judgments on Sittlichkeit, morality, 
uh, or law, uh, but new forms of consciousness could in fact develop historically via learning. And of course, as I said, uh, this influenced deeply uh, Karl Marx's own analysis. And the point of all of this is the inalienability of conscience that was established in the Reformation and in the Renaissance and other historical periods that should also apply to association and labor relations. Um, David Ellerman describes a, an application or a metaphor of statistical concepts in the type one and type two errors when human beings are actually treated as things. Um, I could also refer to Martin Buber's notion of I-you or I-thou relations uh, versus I-it relations. And of course, these, these can apply more generally than in work or labor relations, as well as uh, if we talk about the platform economy, users, clients, and other stakeholders. And I think uh, Dominique uh, Lambert will be holding a talk next Wednesday on Taiha de Chardin, where uh, possibly such concepts will be uh, also uh, in focus. To uh, cite the uh, Scottish computer scientist and political economist uh, Paul Cockshut, he says, like Turing, uh, talking about Alan Turing's machine, human labor can be seen as a universal value, as in principle, any human can perform any task any other human can perform, allowing in normal variations in strength, skill, and learning capability. He thus refers to humans as universal labor machines, a play on Turing's own universal Turing machine. I personally prefer Gregory Bateson's notion of humans as having skills that are so different that they make a difference. And similarly, the Democrat, Democratizing Work Manifesto states, working humans are so much more than resources. Mariana Mazzucato's uh, new book, The Mission Economy, I think is an important framing tool um, she uses the example of, um, in fact, uh, the Apollo mission. Uh, and we could also use other missions, but um, the point is, what is a mission economy? And um, Mazzucato boils this down to a very clear um, kernel, or distills this to a kernel. She says one should start with a challenge. Uh, what is a problem? Climate change, for instance. Develop missions accordingly to this challenge that are, in fact, outcome-oriented. Where do we want to be in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, 50 years? And encourage investment and innovation respective of that mission. She also encourages cathedral thinking. So what does this mean? Of course, cathedrals were built in multiple generations. They were not finished in five years or 10 years. Uh, they cost a lot of money, but the, the goal was the, was, was the uh, motivation. This is Karl Kobenz here, which, who was the local concert, one could say, a representative of the Empress Maria Theresia, who was principal in founding the Académie Royale de Belgique, uh, which could be seen as a mission, uh, I suppose. But Mazzucato focuses on the Apollo missions. So I'll just take her example. <laughs> and she says, in fact, um, what identified the Apollo mission? And she developed six different um, attributes, one of which is leadership by government. She says, um, the, what made the feat possible and successful was leadership by government that had a vision, it took risks to achieve it and put its money where its mouth was and collaborated widely with organizations willing to help. Um, risk taking and innovation was a second important factor. A valuable lesson from Apollo, she says, in other missions is the importance of taking risks and adapting to new information and circumstances, trial and error, and um, overcoming the fear, fear of failure is part of risk taking. Organizational change is the, the third factor that she mentions. Um, and moving beyond part of organizational change means moving beyond siloed, uh, siloed and compartmentalized um, organizations, which NASA in fact was before George Muller in 1963 took over. So it's important to communicate, which is why I so much appreciate the Académie Royale, where we bring together many different disciplines and many different um, uh, sciences and artists and others. So the fourth factor is spillovers, which is in fact that one should retain some of one's, uh, one's um, income, for instance, even looking at an individual or at a state for supporting research and development, looking at the trade-off between long and short-term focus. Uh, of course, in her first book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, Mazzucato outlined some of the spill-offs from the, or sp spillovers rather, from the Apollo project, looking at, for instance, smartphones, uh, many other Teflon, such things. 
Finance is an important element. She says that it can in fact harness the multiplier effect, which of course means that every single euro or another currency that is, um, that is employed actually influences much more um, investment than just one euro. In fact, as part of the finance element of these missions, they should be judged by outcomes and not costs in the normal budgetary sense. And the last element is partnership. She says the deciding factor uh, in the case of NASA was proven capabilities and experience, not just cost. And in fact, NASA had in its um, contracts with its uh, suppliers a no excess profits clause. So in fact, um, space as it was, Profits were fine, but space should not become a speculative affair driven by overcharging and by companies more competent in brochures. Today's missions are very different than going to the moon, says Mazzucato. We have the Sustainable Development Goals, which are very much political, very much social, uh, and of course they involve citizen participation and even leadership. So she says, in fact, while we might look at the first generation of mission-oriented policies uh, following a big science meets big problems logic. Today, we need much different, uh, a different logic. So she developed seven principles that uh, are useful in this regard. The first of which is uh, seeing value creation as a collective activity. So we shouldn't just have cheerleaders. And um, we should define value as something that is produced by multiple stakeholders um, cooperating together to produce some common end. The second is market shaping rather than market correction. And she says it's not about creating a level playing field, but tilting the playing field, which means actually picking willing partners and aligning instruments uh, that are available to government to steer the economy in the direction that produces the kind of value we want. And uh, she suggests tools like taxation, which can be used to reward value creation over value extraction uh, and to steer value creation towards building an economy that is more inclusive and sustainable. So these seem like obvious uh, choices. The role of organizations is something that um, Masukato focuses on it well, as well. And of course, we need a new vision of organizations, she suggests. This is a picture from the book by Marvin Brown, what a uh, enterprise would look like in a, an economy of provision rather than of um, extraction, one might say. In fact, in the middle, we have conversations as opposed to profit. Long-term finance is uh, the fourth of her principles. She says, in fact, one needs a, an entirely different view of, of, of the role of finance, not of increasing, but rather of, of stewarding, as uh, the um, economist Robert Schiller, another winner of the Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize in economics, suggests. In fact, Schiller looks at the notion of finance, the term itself, etym etymologically, and it comes from the Latin word finis. So finance are the means to complete something, a project, a mission. So the question Mazzucato says we should begin with is what needs to be done, and then we need to move to the point of how to pay for it, rather than the other way around. The fifth principle is pre-distribution, and this goes back to what our own Isabel Ferreras was saying. It's not just about redistribution, but we must ask who is actually the firm? Who does the firm belong to? Um, she says we must reward the entire set of value creators. I'm talking about Mazzucato here. And uh, we should enable the recreation of that value by investing in the sources of that creativity. And they must be the sources replenished rather than extracted. A new notion of partnership, a new notion of contract is needed. Emphasis on collective value creation, says Mazzucato, means that how we design the collaborations between business and government matters. The notion of purpose, she says, and stakeholder value is not only about changes to corporate governance, but also about the details of contracts between business and the state. She looks at these as being either symbiotic or parasitic. And I have here a picture of the, uh, let me see if this thingy thing works here. Yes. 
the, the um, traditional image that is used in, in economics today is the prisoner's dilemma uh, w where there is no communication. Of course, everyone has seen this to some extent. I'm sure there are even shows on Netflix that describe a prisoner's dilemma. Does one defect? Does one cooperate? And of course, the best outcome in this case is usually that both defect and both go to jail. And we should move away from this as being the benchmark model to one of what would what one could call, according to Robert Aumann, a correlated equilibrium where we have communication and uh, commitment. This should be part of the model and not external to it. Participation is her very last principle. Of course, again, whereas the New Deal, the Apollo mission were all very heavily top-down missions, the missions of today, again, the Sustainable Development Goals, require the participation of communities and citizens. So this should be an essential part of how we achieve missions today. So this is all very nice, but um, again, pointing it back at the firm is the question of, you know, again, of this talk, why should firms be part of a sustainable economy? Now, in a very brief uh, uh, sketch of my answer to that question, I would say that firms account for between 50 to 70% of world trade, most of that taking place within firms, so it's inter-firm trade not taking place in the market. The sustainable development goals themselves were specifically designed with firms in mind, whereas the millennium development goals before them were not. So it's already the point. And the point is also that firms mediate relationships in society. They do have agency, as even Frank Knight pointed out, uh, and the corporate social responsibility and notions like compliance are a logical evolution within a rather unregulated market economy. They should not be seen as exceptions or novelties. So it's, of course, they are not the end of the, of the story <laughs> or the end of history. Uh, but all of this speaks to the importance of firms and specifically speaks to their role in actually achieving a mission economy. And uh, one might even speak in this regard of a moral economy here on the bottom right is a picture of the British historian E.P. Thompson, who coined this, uh, this notion of the moral economy. So now I've talked about the need for downward translation. We've talked about what a firm is. We've discussed the mission economy and even somewhat sketched the firm's role in the mission economy. Now what? And I would say, if you can tilt your head to read that or just listen, it's fine if you just listen. Uh, we need to rethink uh, uh, private law. That's part of the, the agenda, I think. Um, and here, I think Otto von Gierke, who I've mentioned already, is a very important um, uh, actor who has, uh, in fact, suggested that um, a notion of social law, and he's not talking about social welfare, he's talking about a mezzanine or a level between uh, private law, property law, and, say, public or, or state law. Um, and in fact, um, Gierke, Gierke opposed association, the notion of association with domination as two logics that one can continually see throughout history. And he associates much of modern property law with the connection between Roman uh, unlimited rights, as I've described very briefly before, and the medieval combination of ownership and rulership. So these are ideas that are very useful that, we, that I think we need to integrate. We should also integrate an evolutionary approach looking at concepts like macroculture, this image here, you know, two people are doing something. Again, you have just a process of social learning going on here, uh, which is very important, I think, in this move towards a embedding missions within firms. Also important are notions, measures for institutions for ensuring accountability, equity, and inclusion different stakeholders within the firm, particularly we have those who are the most, again, as Isabel Ferreira suggested, that are affected by the governance of the firm. This might be users, it might be workers, it might be some other stakeholders. We have to look at the particular context. Of course, Mark Granovetter, uh, Emil Durkheim, both suggested that the real contract, the content of a contract lies outside of the piece of paper. It's a relationship. At this point comes my only contribution in French, since I translated this quote into English in my dissertation, I thought I would read it in the original French. And it comes from the Greek-French scholar Cornelius Castoriadis in his uh, essay La police grecque et la création de la démocratie. He says, Jusqu'à la Grèce est en dehors de la tradition grecque occidentale, 
les sociétés sont instituées sur les principes d'une stricte clôture. Notre vision du monde est la seule qui est en sens et qui soit vraie. Les autres sont bizarres, inférieurs, pervers, mauvais, déloyants, etc. etc. Comme l'observait Hannah Arendt, l'impartialité est venue au monde avec Homer. Et cette impartialité n'est pas simplement affective, mais touche la connaissance et la compréhension. La véritable entrée pour les autres est née avec les Grecs, et cette entrée n'est jamais euh, qu'un autre aspect du regard critique et inter interrogateur qu'ils portent sur leur propre institution. Autrement dit, ils s'inscrit dans les mouvements démocratiques et philosophiques créés par les Grecs. I'm, excuse me. <laughs> to Castoriadis, it is in fact the, the, the distinction uh, in the Greeks of a creating nature, a natura naturans, as opposed to a natura naturata, a ready-made nature that is given by the gods that, that matters. And this shared sense of creation also means the need for a collective imagination, and imaginaire, as Castoriadis called it. This is a distinguishing feature of the evolutionary process of societies and organizations. As Dutch communication scientist Lute Leidestoff argues following Niklas Luhmann, while genetic codes are hardwired, social codes must be continually reproduced. The way that they are reproduced is a historical process. This means it will take a collective act Uh, including the division of mental and physical labor to realize a just transition, it cannot be commandeered from above. Um, so, to close, a multi-stakeholder approach is necessary again, moving from the principal agent model to an associated agent model. Just to quote from uh, Samuel Bowles uh, in his new uh, Economics of Welfare and Inequality, He says, the wealth of nations, as Adam Smith knew, depends critically on the structure of economic governance or economic institutions for short, and the same can be said for the wealth of communities and firms. Ideally, he says, the structure of governance is a means of avoiding or attenuating coordination failures, but there is nothing in the process determining the evolutionary of governance structures that ensures this result. Governance structures may endure because they are favored by powerful groups for whom they secure a large slice of a given pie, not because these structures foster growth, the growth of the pie itself. So again, as I said, the image of the Nash equilibrium and the prisoner's dilemma is incorrect or is not useful to this end. So in fact, Bowles argues that changes in governance structure change transaction costs and benefits, saying, consider a single owner of a machine who hires a single worker to operate the machine who has no wealth. Uh, the worker has little reason to supply a high level of effort since the worker is paid a given wage and the owner is the residual claimant on the income associated with the asset and hence receives the profit from the worker's labor. The residual, residual claimant owns whatever remains after all fixed claims, such as wages, are settled. Thus, without costly monitoring, productivity in the firm will suffer, but monitoring uses up resources that could have otherwise been productively employed. The generic problem here is that behaviors critical to high levels of productivity, hard work, maintenance of productive equipment, risk-taking, the production and the use of knowledge and the like, are difficult to monitor and hence cannot be fully specified in any contract enforceable at low cost. As a result, he concludes, key economic actors, workers and managers, for example, cannot capture the productivity effects of their actions as they would, for instance, if they were the residual claimants on the resulting income stream and asset value. The result of these incentive problems is that a highly concentrated ownership of capital goods is often inefficient. And the point is, I think that we have too seldomly looked at reforms to the structure of the firm as a potential for creating value. As we are increasingly entering a world where the adage is the wealth of networks instead of the wealth of nations, the manner of relations in which firms have with their stakeholders, both internal and external, is becoming more and more important while their ability to harness the logic of authority to dictate resource allocation will continue to fade. So, Again, the, if we are going to surmount the challenges of social and environmental inequality, we have to discuss as societies how the costs and benefits will be distributed. That means radical new governance mechanisms, experimentation, collective risk-taking, new missions, and new missions associated with these tasks. And um, 
th there must be emphasis on process in this. So to conclude, the SDGs are not all equally urgent. So this is the first time I have brought in this graph in this way. Uh, and again, there is a priority. And at the top here, you see, in fact, growth. And some company might just emphasize, you know, we're fulfilling our mission to the SDGs by focusing on growth. But you are neglecting by that the other uh, systems on which growth actually depends. So again, these must be prioritized, which means constraints. These require a logic for distributing the constraints, that we have bargaining, authority, or discourse. And because fairness is an issue, I suggest discourse as the logic that we need to employ, and this should be the case even in firms. So on the left, this is my very last slide, you have one of the very first, if not the very first, image of a human with a non-human uh, head to be found 40,000 years ago this was produced. So we have the notion of creativity in our genes, and on the right here, you have from the 1940 Disney film Fantasia, uh, Mickey Mouse as the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Everyone, I'm sure, has seen this, where, of course, he decides to uh, magically uh, 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 influence the brooms to, to do his work for him. And this ends in a disaster. So we need a collective effort at solving today's problems. Not only individual genius can, can suffice. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.